An umbilical cord is a tube containing veins and arteries that supplies oxygenated, nutrient-rich blood and removes low oxygen, nutrient-depleted blood from a developing embryo or fetus of a placental mammal. A placenta is an organ that develops and attaches to the wall of the uterus during pregnancy. The umbilical cord develops from the remnants of the yolk sac and allantois. It forms by the fifth week of development, replacing the yolk sac as the source of nutrients for the embryo. By week eight, this embryo will be referred to as a fetus until it is born. The umbilical cord by full term is usually around 50 centimeters long and about two centimeters in diameter. It enters the fetus via the abdomen at the point which will, after birth, become the umbilicus, also known as a belly button or navel. The umbilical cord normally contains two umbilical arteries, a single umbilical vein, an obliterated allantois duct, all surrounded by Wharton's jelly, a gelatinous substance that protects the blood vessels inside. The umbilical vein carries oxygenated, nutrient-rich blood to the fetal heart, and the two umbilical arteries carry deoxygenated, nutrient-depleted blood away from the fetal heart. During pregnancy, the fetus's blood circulates differently than it does after birth. This is because during pregnancy, the fetus relies on its mother and her blood for nourishment and oxygen. Whereas after birth, the baby will be able to receive nourishment by ingesting food and oxygen by breathing with their lungs. The mother and the fetus do not share blood. Instead, oxygen and nutrients from the mother's blood passes through the placenta and into the fetal blood. This oxygen and nutrient rich blood is then carried through the umbilical vein to the fetal heart. There, it makes its way around the body, depositing the oxygen and nutrients where needed and absorbing any waste byproducts like carbon dioxide. By the time the blood has reached the umbilical arteries, it is depleted of both oxygen and nutrients and instead contains waste. From the umbilical arteries, the blood flows back into the placenta, where the waste products are released across the placenta and back into the mother's blood. At the same time, the fetal blood once again absorbs the oxygen and nutrients that the mother has deposited via the placenta, thus completing one whole cycle. A number of abnormalities can affect the umbilical cord, which can cause problems that affect both mother and child. These are umbilical cord compression, when the cord becomes compressed so that the baby is not getting enough blood, umbilical cord prolapse, when the umbilical cord comes out of the uterus with or before the presenting part of the baby, possibly causing umbilical cord compression. Velamentous cord insertion, when fetal blood vessels are not encased within the protective umbilical cord and they insert into the fetal membranes, possibly leading to a hemorrhage or death of the fetus. Vasa previa, when fetal blood vessels are not encased within the umbilical cord and cross over or run near the internal opening of the uterus, putting them at risk of rupture. And single umbilical artery, which is when there is only one umbilical artery instead of two. This is the most common abnormality, and in most cases the baby is normal and healthy. However, in some cases, it can be a sign that there is another, more concerning abnormality present. After the birth, the umbilical cord will still contain blood. This is called cord blood and controversially can be banked and used to harvest stem cells. After around three minutes, this blood will naturally clot, allowing the cord to effectively clamp itself and halting the flow of blood. At any point, but usually after at least a minute, the doctor will clamp the cord, at which point the baby no longer receives oxygen or nutrients from the mother. With their first breaths of air, the baby's lungs will start to expand so that the blood can now oxygenate by passing through the lungs. Clamping is followed by cutting the cord, which is painless due to the absence of nerves. The cord is extremely tough, like thick sinew, and so cutting it requires a suitably sharp instrument. After cutting the cord, the newborn wears a plastic clip on the navel area until the clamped region of the cord has dried and sealed sufficiently. The length of the umbilical cord left attached to the newborn varies, and the stub left behind remains for up to 10 days as it dries and then falls off, leaving behind the belly button. 
This means that the belly button is essentially a scar, and whether you have an innie or an outie simply depends on how your skin heals. Some parents choose to omit cord severance entirely in a practice called lotus birth or umbilical non-severance. The entire intact umbilical cord and placenta is allowed to dry and separate on its own, typically on the third day after birth, falling off and leaving a healed umbilicus. After birth, internally, there is still an umbilical vein and two umbilical arteries. The umbilical vein collapses and becomes a ligament, which is a tough connective tissue that remains attached to the inner belly button and the liver it serves no real purpose. The sections of the umbilical arteries that are closest to the belly button also become ligaments and remain attached to the belly button area. Here, they provide no function other than to support the bladder. This is why, if you push your belly button, you may feel it in your bladder. The more internal section of the umbilical arteries remain part of the circulatory system, supplying blood to the bladder, ureters, and in men, the vas deferens. <laughs>